great to be with you today. I'm so excited about this message. Um, why don't you turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 8, Luke 8, and, um, and, and let me just say while you're doing that, that um, if you, this Easter season is, of course, right upon us, and I have a, a really a message that I, I think is going to really change the way that you, you look at the Easter season and really how God's planned for your life. I've got a special sermon series I'm going to be starting on Easter called I Need a Win. I Need a Win. And, um, and because this is a baseball town and, um, and, and, and you know, we're, the Cardinals open, I think, a week after Easter, I'm going to be basically showing how there's a pattern that continues to unveil itself throughout all of Scripture, and that it works the same way that baseball works in a, in a lot of ways. And so, um, but he, here's the real crux of the series. There are people who feel like they're losing at places in their lives. Maybe they're winning in their career, but they're losing in marriage. Maybe they feel like they're losing on this desperate losing season all the way around. Or, or maybe they feel like that they're winning in relationships, but they're losing in, in their own personal fulfillment. And regardless of where you're at, when you're in one of those, those kind of moments, you just there's kind of this cry of your heart that says, I need a win. I, I just need to feel like that this is changing direction and that we're heading in, in a way that's positive and not negative. And so I want to encourage you to invite someone uh, with you this Easter season for Easter services for this I Need a Win series. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be so relevant, but it's also going to really communicate um, what Jesus did for us and the great turnaround that he, he brought us uh, on the cross. And so I want to encourage you to do that. We're going to have some fun baseball-filled uh, kind of extras to the series, but it's going to be a really, really fun series, but also life-changing. So I want to encourage you to invite people to this series uh, starting on Easter weekend. So now we're going to jump into this, this message. Let me tell you how I got to this message. There, um, it, it, most days I sit down with the Bible and I let God speak to me and, and, and God speaks to me in my, my kind of personal time. And most of the time that stays with me. It never makes it to you. I kind of, uh, you know, I, I, God says those things to me, but occasionally there will be something that God so profoundly says to me that I feel like he wants to say it to you as well. And so today I'm going to take you into my uh, my private time and just something that God had to say to me, had to, to talk out with me and walk out with me, and, um, and, and it's called Bad Spot. It's called Bad Spot. And so um, we're going to look at Luke 8 in that passage of scripture, but let me, let me tell you this story. So I, I was on a plane recently, and this epiphany hit me, how much that traveling on airplanes has increased my prayer life. Um, I, I'm on uh, airplanes fairly frequently, and, and, and I've just noticed that I'm much more spiritual when I'm on airplanes. For instance, after I put my luggage up, recently I noticed that, that my ticket said that I had a middle seat, which is an awful revela revelation that there is a seat on to the left and to the right of you, and you have to sit in the middle. And so immediately, I began to pray, God, give me an empty row. Please, Lord Jesus, this seat, let it be a part of an empty row. And so as I'm walking down the aisle, I see um, the general area that I think I'm going to be seated in, and I notice that there's an open middle seat, and to the left of that middle seat is, is a, a woman who's holding a crying baby, and to the right of that seat is, is this guy who's on a very boisterous, what seems to be conference call of some sort. So immediately I began, please no God, please no God, please no God, please let not, not be the seat. I, that, that's not my seat, that's not my seat. And, um, and as I get close enough, I look at my ticket and I look at the row and it's not my seat. And so then I'm kind of having a praise break in the aisles. Oh, thank you God, this is not my seat. And, 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 and then I see in the same area, a completely empty row. I mean, a completely empty row, and I'm thinking, that's my seat. So then my prayer shifts to, I declare that's mine in the name of Jesus. I, Satan, I bind you from taking it from me. It is mine. I can, well, God says I can have whatever he says I can have. And I mean, I'm just going through all, and, and then I get close to it, and I realize that this row, the completely empty row, my seat is behind that row. And there behind that row sits this perfectly positioned middle seat with on either side, giant men, <laughs> like, like pro wrestler sized men. And to, to the fact that when I sat down, I'm pretty certain they're pro wrestlers because it smelled as though they had just finished a match. And, 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 and for the next two hours, that was my bad spot. You know, all mine, nobody else. No, no, no. This is my bad spot. So, so let me ask you, have you ever had a bad spot? Have you ever been in a bad spot? I hear people say this, you know, occasionally. They'll say, Pastor Joe, I mean, my marriage is in a bad spot. I have other people say that, you know, Pastor Joe, where I work, 
bad spot. I mean, the people, the, 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 it's just, it's a bad spot. Other people will tell me that, you know, my health is in a bad spot. You know, my career's in a bad spot. I'm just, I'm in a bad spot in my mind. And, and whether it's a physical place or a figurative place, I mean, we've all kind of experienced a bad spot before in our lives. And, and that's really not any new news, you know? I mean, because the truth is, is that, you know, if everybody has experienced them, so that's not really, you know, profound. And, and, and equally, no one wants to stay in them, so that's not really profound. But, you know, the, the thing about a bad spot is, is it can suck the life out of you quicker than anything else. I mean, when you're stuck in a bad spot. It just pulls out of it. And if you notice, you'll beg and plead and pray to God to get you out of that spot. I mean, God, I'll bargain with you. God, move me, change them, alter this, whatever it has to happen. Get me out of this spot is kind of the general prayer. So none of this is really news to us, but that's not really the idea I'd like to explore today. What I'd like to explore is when you're in a bad spot and you're trying to get away and God tells you to stay. Like, you know, when you're in, you're in that place that you despise, hate, wonder why God's not gotten you out of it already, when you want to step away, but God says, hey, stay. That's the idea that I would really want to look at today. And I, I think that this uh, account in Luke 8 um, is probably one that maybe you're familiar with, but I bet you've never seen it this way. And so let, let's start there with, with uh, verse 26. It says, they, they being Jesus and the disciples, they sailed to the region of the Gerene, and it says, which uh, was across the, lake, uh, across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. And for a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. Now, let let me give you a little context. Jesus has been on a teaching tour, and um, and, and he's kind of needing some rest. And so he loads up with the disciples and says, let's go find a place that we can rest. And they sail away from Jesus' normal ministry route to to this, 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 this kind of separate area, looking for kind of a mini vacation. Jesus' foot hits the shore, and he is greeted by a demon-possessed man. Not exactly the vacation I think that he was looking for. But nonetheless, Jesus has a low, low tolerance for demons and the effects that they have on someone's life. And so he casts the demons out of the man and into a nearby grazing herd of pigs. The pigs, when the demons enter them, go into a frenzy, and they run off of a cliff. Now, it's at this time that I personally believe Judas probably looked at Peter and said, remember that $5 you said you'd pay back when pigs flew? (laughs) This is also from my estimation, and I'm not a scholar, but this is the first time in Scripture that deviled ham appears. And and at this point, I'm not going to hog all the jokes, so I'm going to keep moving on. Now, just want to make sure you're listening. Mark has the similar account, and he tells us there are 2,000 pigs. And so this is a very lucrative business for this town. As a matter of fact, imagine Jesus going to your favorite dealership and casting demons into 2,000 cars and all of them driving off of a cliff. It's the same kind of effect. So the town shows up and sees two things. They see all the pigs that are missing, and they see this man who has been a raving lunatic. Scripture tells us that he, he was so possessed that he, he did not wear clothes, did not have a home, lived among tombs, that, that, that he was so possessed that he would have supernatural strength to break uh, chains, that he would cut himself and seize this possessed. They see this, what was a raving lunatic, sitting at Jesus' feet, Scripture says, in his right mind, listening to Jesus. Now, what's strange and kind of an, an interesting turn of events is that the town does not celebrate this. Turns out they love pigs more than this man. And, and, and instead, they reject Jesus, completely reject Jesus. And it picks up in verse 37. It says, then all the people of the region asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. Now, verse 38 is the one I really want to settle on. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him. But Jesus sent him away. Begged. You have to imagine this man, he's finally free, like finally free. Nobody cared about me up to this point, and Jesus comes to the shore and delivers me from this, this, this oppression that we, we can't even imagine. And so I'm finally free, and nobody wants to celebrate it. And not only do they not want to celebrate it, the best thing that has ever happened to me, they want to send away. 
So it is a reasonable request that this man basically says, Jesus, these people don't want you. I want you. Just, just let me get on the boat with you. Let, let me leave with you. Don't leave me in this bad spot. And what may be the strangest part of the story is next. So Jesus basically, the man who wants to leave with Jesus, gets left by Jesus. It's the craziest thing. Jesus, in essence, basically says, hey, I know these people don't want anything to do with me, and I know they're not going to celebrate what I've done in you. I fully get this is a bad spot, but I need you to stay. And, and, and it's kind of at this moment when you read passages like this that, that at least I have these thoughts like, Jesus needs a campaign manager. Because if you're running for savior of the world, this is not an effective strategy. Like, you don't leave a guy that's been through this much in such a bad spot. Like, you, you don't leave. If you're running for the Savior of the world, you save people. You don't leave them in bad spots. I mean, this is not the image that you want, Jesus, if you want to be seen as caring and compassionate. But then it, you kind of have this moment where you realize Jesus isn't running for Savior of the world because he is the Savior of the world. And, and there's this thing that's inside of us, especially when we're in a bad spot, that we've spent so much time talking about how much Jesus loves us as an individual, and you, you've heard that, Jesus loves you, he'll do anything for you, he loves you, he loves you, he loves you. We've heard that so much that we start seeing Jesus not as a personal savior, but as a personal servant. To where all of a sudden, when we have something bad happen in our lives, or we're in a bad spot, we start looking to Jesus to say, how come you haven't fixed this yet? There's a, a really dangerous theology that, I see many people adhere to when they're in a bad spot. I call it meology. It's the belief that everything is about me. I mean, when you're in a bad spot, that's what you start to believe is that everything is about me. You say, now, now, here's the thing about meology. A lot of people hold it, but very few people would ever admit they actually hold it. You know, but I'll, I'll give you some of its core symptoms. For instance, if you adhere to meology, your language is laced with me. What about me? Why me? What, what are you going to do for me? God, when is this going to happen for me? You know, and, and it's not just your language. Your prayers focus centrally on me. I mean, if we were to take an inventory of your prayers, when you're in a bad spot, it's pretty often that most of those prayers end up being about me. They're not about people outside of me. They're not about people, things that are outside of me, things that don't benefit me. They're all about me. And, and meology, I think, is best really, really displayed when we say God is good if he's good to me. Right? I mean, and, and, and let me just be honest, church folk are the best at this. Like, because if we're honest, there's somewhere along the way that we start to believe because we give and serve and show up regularly that God loves me more than he loves the people that don't do that. And so, therefore, we expect more from him and we're disappointed with him when he doesn't serve me. And, and, and what's the thing we always say? God is good all the time. and All the time, God is good. Except for when I'm sick or broke or things didn't go the way that I think they should. What if things are bad? Is God still good? You know, this is the problem. And this is why it's so important if you're in a bad spot that you really, really reconcile your heart to this is because if you're in a bad spot, you may be struggling to understand how a good God left you in a bad spot. And, and I mean, you wouldn't say that out loud and you probably would never put it where anybody could. But I mean, those thoughts do arise in our hearts in those moments. And, 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 and so this, this is interesting when you look at it. Because you just start to realize that this meology has to be corrected. And, you know, so I did some deep study. And I really looked for the most profound of theological statements. And, and really, really made sure that this showed the depth of the realities that is God's word. And this is what I came up for you if you're suffering with meology like I have at times. It's not about us. It's not about you. It's not about me. The more that you believe the purpose of your life is to f make you feel like that, that you're fulfilled only and that all your needs are met and that, that the, what your wants and desires are taken care of, the more that you believe that about yourself, the deeper you're going into meology. Life is not about, your, it's far beyond just your family and your career and your dreams. 
To, to really understand the purpose of life, you can't start with me. You have to start with the one who created me. If you really want to grasp this understanding that sometimes you're in a bad spot, and how does that play into what God's trying to do, sometimes you have to realize that the purpose of life is about Him. Because here, here's the truth. God knows your situation, and He's using your situation so you can know Him better. See, God knows. God is not absent. He doesn't, he's not missed the memo. It's not like your email didn't make it to him. The truth is, God knows. And he's, he's using that situation so that you'll know him better. Because that's the purpose. Now, what's interesting when you read this, this, this passage is, is that this guy doesn't struggle with that at all. Like, we don't see him debate with Jesus. We don't see him plead or beg or bargain with Jesus. All we find is that this man basically, he, he just... He does what Jesus says. It's, it's almost strange in the sorts. I mean, he just stays and obeys. And so, so I, I just wanted to look a little deeper to finish out today. I, I want to look a little deeper at what he does that maybe we could do it when we're in a bad spot. And so, so I just answered this question with what he does. How do I find good in a bad spot? And so there, there, it's really simple. Here, here's the first one. Remember God is faithful. Remember God is faithful. If you're in a bad spot, the first pl place you need to look is back to where how far God has brought you. Look, look what it says in, in uh, verse 27. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet. Now, I, I want to try to help you grasp the gravity of what this man has been dealing with. Most scholars agree that this man ha is possessed by no less than 5,000 demons. He is not possessing them. They are possessing him. It is so much that this man is not this man any longer. He is what these demons want him to be. He does what these demons choose for him to do. The Bible says that sometimes he will, he will go into to, to schisms, and sometimes that he will, he will break chains, and sometimes he'll cut himself, and he doesn't wear clothes, and he doesn't live at home, because they possess him, he doesn't possess them. And the darkness that is in him is, is greater than anything Hollywood has ever dreamed up in your favorite horror flick. I mean, we're talking about darkness that most of us will never know is what this man is experiencing. And these 5,000 demons do whatever they want with him, but the moment that Jesus' foot touches the shore, they immediately bow at Jesus. And this is really important to grasp because it tells us, number one, there is no bondage or darkness or addiction that is so great that it is greater than Jesus. But, but beyond that, it tells us this, that there is no person who is beyond the grace of Jesus. And, and that's important to know because I think in our minds, we start to think, well, they've just went too far. They've, they've just done too much. God's never going to be able to reach them. And we kind of build these boxes that the grace of God cannot be contained in because as long as someone is still breathing, there is still an opportunity for the grace of God to reach them. That's why you must possess hope to know that as long as they're still taking breaths, there is a grace that can reach them and transform their lives. Now, now, now but, but that's not all. That, 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 that Jesus could do this, but everyone has given up on this man. Everyone. This town is fine to let him be there and we'll be here. Everyone except for Jesus. Jesus just felt like this guy was worth saving. He, he felt like it was so worth it that he crossed the whole lake for one man. To Jesus, it was worth it that, that he would, would face 5,000 demons for one person. That, that he would, would value two, this one person over 2,000 pigs. That's Jesus' view. And why that's important is, is for this reason, this reason alone. He's done the same thing for you. God crossed out of eternity into earth for you. God faced all of hell for you. And, and, and Jesus felt that you were so worth it that he felt like you were worth more than his life. And so he, he gladly bared it on the cross for you. He felt like you were worth saving. Now, here's what's interesting. I say that, and you're sitting there going, yeah, you know, God did feel that way. God did do that for me. God, that's right. God has brought me a long way. God has done a lot in my life. And that's the key. Is that your forgetfulness has created the frustration that you have in your bad spot. You've simply forgotten how far God's brought you. You've just forgotten 
Now, what you're in right now seems like it's a major, big, huge deal. But in the view of everything that God has done for you, it's not that big of a deal. You see, our forgetfulness of our past situation and how God handles them creates frustration in our present situation. I don't think this is really all that profound. I just think that that guy, he asked Jesus to go. Jesus says no, and here's what he does. He just simply remembers where he was without Jesus. He just goes, you know what? I remember what that darkness was like. I remember what it was like to not be in control of my own life. I, 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 just, I remember what it was like to not be with my family, what it was to have no peace and no joy. And, 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 and I guess he just stood on shore and he finally goes, you know what? If God can deliver me from that, well, then I can trust him with this. <laughs> See, if you're in a bad spot, that's what you've got you to grasp. If God delivered you from that, fill in the blank, whatever it is, if he, if he took care of that, then you got to just remember he can take care of this. If God healed that in your marriage, he can take care of this in your marriage. If God did that for your kid, he can take care of this for your kid. If once in your finances God did that, why can't he just take care of this again? You, you just see this, this idea that when we cut off or forget what God has done for us, it stops us from believing what God can do for us. And so there's just this profound idea that when you're in a bad spot, just stop and remember how far God's brought you. And that if he can handle that, he can handle this. Now, 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 here, here's the second point. And it's actually the final point. So I think I'm violating some kind of preacher rule because I think we're supposed to work in threes. But we only got two today. It's that simple. How do you find good in a bad spot? You remember God is faithful. Here's number two recognize God's purpose. Luke 8, 38, Jesus sent him away saying, return home and tell him how much God's done for you. So the man went away and told all over the town how much Jesus had done for him. Now, um, I want you to grasp this. When you're in a bad spot, you better recognize that sometimes, often, God doesn't deliver you, he turns you into a deliverer. See, when you're in a bad spot, more than not, God's not going to deliver you. He's going to turn you into a deliverer. Because the scripture tells us that Jesus was sent to destroy the works of the devil, but he doesn't only destroy them in us, he destroys them through us in others. So he's not going to just destroy the works of the devil in you, he's going to take what he did in you and destroy it in other people as well. And so here are just three statements. They're not really building. They're not facts. They're not necessarily these things that, you know, this is how and, and fix them all together. Here's what I think. I'm going to say these three things, and some are going to apply to you and some not. But they're true if you're trying to find God's purpose in a bad spot. And here's the first one. God will recycle your pain for his purpose. God didn't cause your pain. He's not responsible necessarily for it, but he can recycle it for his purpose. Now, I think this guy comes to Jesus, and they're getting ready to push off on the boat, and he says, Jesus, I want to come with you. you got a boat. you got 12 disciples. I nominate myself to be the 13th. I mean, a baker's dozen, Jesus, is what you're looking for. And he, and he probably even said, you know what, Jesus, I'm going to be the 13th because I've got a bad feeling about that guy named Judas, and so I think you could use me, okay? So I want to leave with you, Jesus, and, and here's why I want to leave with you, Jesus, is because, to be honest with you, I don't want to stay here because these people know me. And they know what I've done, and they know the despicable acts I've committed. And Jesus, it would be a whole lot easier if you'd take me to a town where nobody knew about what I've done, and I don't have to relive these shameful, embarrassing things. Now, and I get that, don't you? I mean, I mean maybe you have recently found faith, and like you, you were just like... I mean, you were not of faith before, and now you just see God doing this in your life, and you, you just, maybe you grimace going to the office every day because you know that those people know what you were, and now they see what you are, and you, and you just, it'd just be easier to find a new place to work or a new neighborhood to work, you know, to live into or whatever it is. I mean, I get what he's saying is, Jesus, can we just avoid the shame? Can I avoid the embarrassment of all the things I did? Can I just avoid that? But here's the question I ask. Who better to send? Like, 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 Jesus could have sent any one of the disciples. He could have sent any of them. But he chooses to send this guy. I mean, but who better to send? Who better to, to, to reach out to someone going through a divorce than someone who's recovered through a divorce? You know what I mean? Like, who better to, to send to someone who's struggling with drug addiction than someone who's, who's conquered drug addiction? 
I mean, like, who better to send to the situation that you're dealing with or that you've recovered from? I mean, just who better? And, and, and this is where we come to this, this idea that we, we just have to, with God, your pain can become your platform instead of your prison. Your pain can become your platform instead of your prison. That's what God wants to do with it. What once imprisoned you, he wants to turn around and use it to set other for, others free. But, but here's what I need you to know. That when you shut the door on your past, like I'm not going to talk about it, I'm not going to share it, I'm too embarrassed of it, you also shut the door on God's future for you. Because God can't use you from a platform that's not yours. Where he brought you from is the whole point, is he wants to open the door to help other people follow the same route. And so when we say, no, God, I just, you know, let, use me in some other way. Let me tell a different story. Let me do, I'm just too embarrassed of it. It, it. What we're really saying is, is that we really are still, we really do still believe what we did is greater than what Jesus did. That's what we're really saying. Because a person who fully grasps what Jesus did gladly says, look at what I was to what he has done now. I mean, you, you, they just, uh, look at this. Can you believe this? I can barely believe this. That's how great he is. So I would just warn you, don't shut the door on your past because you may not realize you're shutting the door on what God wants to do in your future. Here's the second one I want you to see. God's primary way of reaching people is through people. God's primary way of reaching people is through people. Now, I think we've all wondered from time to time why God doesn't just peel back heaven, stick his face down, and say, hey, everybody, I'm God. Why don't you follow me? I mean, it seems like, you know, that would be easy. I mean, maybe you've even said, I wonder why God's not saved Oprah, because if she did it, then all these other people would follow. We've all said that. We all thought that. I mean, you know, here's the truth. God, every relationship that God wants is built on faith. So he doesn't want to just stick his face through the heavens and say, hey, here's who I am. You bow down, do what I say. He wants people to believe, even though they've not seen. So here's God's strategy. For a culture opposed to Jesus, God plants people transformed by Jesus. This town wanted nothing to do with Jesus. And so he plants someone who's been transformed by Jesus. That's God's strategy. That's how he wins people. He wins people through people. That's just the way it works. And and, what that means for you and I is, is that your relationship with God is always personal but never private. It's always personal, but it's never meant to be private. Because here's what happens is you're saying, God, why won't you send revival to my bad spot? And he steps back and says, I sent you. God, why don't you transform my office? Because I sent you. Why, God, my family, can't you send revival? I sent you. That's always been God's plan. He reaches people through people. Now, I want you to notice, though, because when you hear things like that, you start to go to your excuse checklist, and you start to to, to mark off why you can't be the person and share the faith and, and share Jesus. I mean, you know, these things. Here's what Jesus did not expect from this man. He did not expect that he know everything. One of the things I often hear from people, they say, you know what? I just don't feel comfortable sharing my faith because I don't know everything. Neither do I. But, but, and that's not what Jesus expects of him. Jesus doesn't say, hey, you got to know it all. Truthfully, if Jesus wanted somebody who knew more, he would have sent one of the other disciples. He could have sent someone who knew more. But, but what he wanted to do was send someone who had been transformed. Because it's one thing to know something, but it's another thing to have been something, and now you're come something completely different. And so he says, hey, I don't need you to know everything. I just need you to go and, 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 and share this. And here's why I believe he didn't do it. This is just personal, you know, you're not going to find this in the Hebrew or the Greek. This is just me. I believe that Jesus wanted to send him because he didn't know Christianese yet. See, he could have sent one of the disciples, but he said, no, don't get around them. You, you still talk normal, <laughs> you know? I mean, you, you, still, you, you still, you don't know Christianese. Now, you know what Christianese is, don't you? It's when someone, it's like when your language changes because you want to appear more spiritual. You know, like somebody comes to your, to your, your desk at the office and they say, hey, um, I'm really going through something, and I, 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 you know, you're kind of a religious person, so, you know, would you, would you pray for me? And it's when you go, of course, <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, I beseech thee on behalf of my co-laborer. 
for your grace and the glorification, your name which is above all things and above all the earth and everything under the earth. And then they're just like, you know what? I'm good. I'm good. I don't need that. I, I, I just, I'm good. You know, that's Christianese. What Jesus is saying is, send him back before we indoctrinate him with all the Christianese so he can still talk to people without them thinking he'd be weird. You don't need to know everything. You don't have to have it all figured out. You, you just have to go back and show, live among them, and show that you're, you're just different. That's all it is. It, 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 and, and here's what I want you to know. If you know enough of the gospel to be saved, you know enough of it to share it with somebody else. If you know enough of it to be saved, you know enough to share it with somebody else. That's all you need to know. Now, now it, it, here's the other thing Jesus did not expect of this man. He did not expect him to know everything, and he did not expect him to reach everyone. He didn't say, go back, and this whole town is yours, and every person you're responsible for. No, what did he say? Return home. Return home. Because where I placed you is where you'll be most effective, among the people who know you. I mean, you have to picture for a moment his family. They knew what was going on. You know, they, they, they kind of got it. I mean, when, when people, you know, walk down the, the grocery aisle, they're like, hey, there's Jim, his kid's out in the tombs, butt naked all the time, you know. That's sad, isn't it? I mean, people knew. Can you imagine what his family experienced when he walked through the door, not like they heard he was, but the way that Jesus left him in a right mind, transformed? Jesus is saying, hey, I don't need you to go back and debate theology. I don't need you to get you a, a, a sound system and stand on the corner of the road. I, I, don't, I don't need you to, to start posting on Facebook all of your great revelations. I just need you to go and live and tell them what I've done for you. That's all I need you to do. I, I, I just need you to go live and try to look as much like me as possible and just keep telling them, what I've done for you. Just keep telling them. Don't just don't. If anybody opens it up, just say, man, did you, did you hear about me? I was a guy that used to run around naked out there. Let me tell you what God did. I mean, that's all I need you to do. God didn't expect him to reach everyone. And, and, and let me just say, this is why I'm so excited about our vision statement this year is because we're serving people far from God near to us. Because, you know, oftentimes we're willing to serve people far from God far from us. But we're serving people far from God near to us because those are the people that know us and can see what God's done in us the best. Now, now I didn't write this in my notes, but I, I just believe that it's something God wants me to say to you. So I'm, I'm going to read it to you. God has placed you somewhere, and it's where you are. See, some of us are so worried about, God, what's next, and where do you want me to be, and where do you want me to, God, well, who do you want me to, where do you want me to, how, where do you want me, where do you want me? And God's saying, I placed you somewhere, and it's exactly where you are. See, some of us are, God, I just, it's like you weren't around when I took this job. And God's saying, no, I wanted you there. God, I wasn't around when you, I mean, I wish you'd have said something when I bought this house because this is a bad spot, it's a bad neighborhood. And he said, no, I put you there. See, God has somewhere for everybody, and it's where you are. So much time, we, we spend so much time on another location, we miss God's purpose in the one we're in. Now, Here's what I want you to see out of this. I think it's interesting. I am, I'm just captivated by Jesus' confidence in this strategy. Like Jesus has a whole town of people who don't want him, and, and they're like, Jesus, what should we do? I mean, should we do direct mail, maybe get a couple billboards? Should we start like some ad campaigns talking about that you really are a good guy? I mean, like, what do you want to do? And he says, you know what? We're good. Let's just leave this one guy here. Like Jesus has a lot of confidence to leave one person in a place that everybody else wants nothing to do with Jesus. He has a lot of confidence. And, and what's interesting is when you study this out, you know, you have to really look for it. But Jesus goes off, and about 18 months later, he returns to this very place. And when he returns, Mark 8 tells us that instead of being rejected by a city, that there are 4,000 people waiting and greeting Jesus, waiting to hear his words. Now, now, now I, just, I just want to do the math. Jesus planted one man, and 18 months later comes back, and there are 4,000 people that want to hear from him. See, that, that's, Jesus is so confident, not in you or me, so confident in the gospel 
that if you'll just simply say what he's done for you, he can plant you in a neighborhood and reap a whole neighborhood. He can plant you in an office and reap a whole office. He's so confident in the gospel that he can put you in a bad family that you wish, how in the world did I end up with this family? And the truth is he can take that whole family because the gospel's so powerful. Jesus has an incredible confidence in the gospel. And that's what he wants to do in you. God's placed you where you're at because he wants to reap that place. And and, and he he didn't call you to win the world. He didn't call you maybe to win the whole city, but he called you to win your office. He called you to win your neighborhood. He's called you to win your family. God wants to reap that. And all he's got to do is plant you and the gospel in you. Now, here's the last one. And and let me just say, if, if, if when you saw this title today, you were like, thank goodness because I'm in a bad spot, and he's going to tell me how God's going to get me out of it. (laughs) I'm sorry. That's not the way this one works. That's not the way most of them work, by the way. For this very point and this point alone, the last one, God's placement is never absent God's purpose. God's placement, never absent God's purpose. Let, Let me say it this way to boil it down for today. Your bad spot is for a good purpose. Your bad spot is for a good purpose. What's your purpose? Well, see, when it comes to purpose and it comes to God, purpose always equals people. God's purpose is always people. It's never been a place. So when God put you somewhere, he didn't put you in a place. He put you there because of a person. Let me break it down for you. It means your bad health may be for a nurse who's taking care of you. Your bad career may be for your boss. Your bad situation may very well be for the people who are watching you deal with that situation. Because God's purpose is always people, and it's never place, it's always people. And so your bad spot is tied to a person that God desperately wants to see come to him. i um, tell you a story. Uh, several years ago, Kayla was driving down the road, and and she came to a busy intersection, and the start and stop traffic um, kind of got to her, and so she rear-ended the person in front of her. And it was not a major, the, the speeds weren't high enough to cause major damage, and, 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 you know, it wasn't, no one was hurt. It was just one of those kind of, it was really inconvenient and, and kind of fender benders, and, um, and it was a bad spot. I mean, anybody that's ever been in a, a car accident, you would say, yeah, that's a bad spot. I mean, at worst, it's super inconvenient, the delay, the insurance issues, and, and at best, you know, I mean, at worst, people get hurt. So it, an accident's never a good thing. It's always a bad spot, and it was even worse for Kayla because, She was babysitting two small girls who were in the car with her. So now she had to explain to these parents about what happened in this this fender bender. And so she braced herself and and got out and was expecting the worst as people are in those moments. You know, people get out in those fender benders like, oh, my check, I mean my neck, I mean my neck, you know. And and so um, she got out, you know, checking on the lady's check, I mean her neck, and, and, and Surprisingly, the woman was actually very kind and introduced herself and actually t- said, there's no damage here. Let's not worry about it. Let, and, and there was a McDonald's that was close, and, and she saw the girls in the car, and she said, why don't we just get out of the way, and, and we'll go in and, and feed them lunch, and, and we, can, you know, we can talk. And so th- this lady invites Kayla to lunch, and they go in and sit down. And while the girls are playing, Kayla just really was taken back by how this person had reacted, and she, she just could perceive such a, a pure heart in this person. So they, they had lunch together, and over their conversation, Kayla just, you know, asked her, you know, are you, are you a believer? What's your faith? Just getting to know her, and she realized she wasn't a Christian. And throughout the conversation, Kayla just so compelled that, that, that this, this person just had such a heart, and she could just sense God's desire to love them. And, and so she, Kayla just, just started to share with her that God loves her and that she's special to God. And then, and then Kayla said, I, I really felt like God had a call on her life. And so I just... I just said, you know, God's got a great calling on your life. She said tears swelled up in the girl's eyes, and the girl had never had anyone. God had never sent anyone to, to share the love of God with her. They exchanged numbers, met up occasionally, you know, had kind of a, a, a really strong acquaintance. But over the years, it, it's it faded. About two weeks ago, Kayla said, hey, do you remember such and such from the accident? I said, yeah, yeah. And she said, on social media, I saw 
that her and her husband are in full-time ministry now. Isn't that incredible? Now, there's a lot of development that happened in her life that didn't have anything to do with Kayla. And, and you know, God brought her a long way. But, but here's what I want to say. Was the damage, I mean, was there damage? Yes. Was there this the frustration? Yes. Was it, it just, you know, did it cost money? Yes. Did, do, I, you, you like, do I want Kayla to start this evangelism course where she goes and rams her car into people? No. You know, it's just, no. Was it a bad spot? Yes. Did God bring it about a good purpose from a bad spot? Yes. And so here's what I want you to grasp. God designed you to be the good in a bad spot. So much of your thoughts and prayers and, and God, how can I get out of here? And God, get me out of here. God designed you to be the good in a bad spot. He placed you there. He's given you the grace to remain there because God designed you, not someone else, you, to be the good in a bad spot. Here, I, I normally don't do this, but just so we can really get it, I, I, I want you to say after me, I'm the good in a bad spot. I want you to close your eyes. Just really focus on God. Say, I'm the good in a bad spot. One more time. I, I, just, I, I just really want you to declare it because some of you are in a spot that is so frustrating, so hurtful. And it's easy, and, and the sermon sounds great, but when you're hooked up to a machine in the hospital, when your marriage is falling apart, when you hate work every day. But I want you to say this. I'm the good in a bad spot. Now, while every head is bowed and every eye is closed in this moment, I'm going to pray for everyone in just a moment. But if you're here today and you would say, you know what, I'm in a bad spot and I don't even know Jesus, which is really the worst spot to be in. I mean, I'd rather be in a bad spot with Jesus than a good spot without him. And so if you're here today and you would say, I don't know Jesus, I'm not following Jesus, truth be known, there's darkness in my life like was in that man's life we read about today. And I need Jesus to transform me, free me, do something in me just like he did for him. If that's you today, I want to pray with you. If today you are making the commitment to follow Christ, I want it, while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, I want you to stick your hand up so I know who I'm praying with. Today, I'm making a decision to follow Christ. Just stick your hand up. Stick your hand up if that's you. See that hand. I see that hand. See that hand. Today, I'm, I'm making a decision to follow Christ. I'm asking God to transform my life. See that hand. Anyone else? This moment's for you. This day's for you. In the same way Jesus crossed that lake, today was about you. Today, I want to follow Jesus. Anybody else? See that hand. Okay. While everyone else's head is bowed and eyes are closed and they're praying for you, I want to lead you in a prayer. It's on the screen right now. It's nothing that's, that's magical. It's more about just putting words to what God's doing in your heart. Heavenly Father, I admit that I'm a sinner and that I am lost without you. I believe Christ died in my place, making a way for us to have a relationship. I choose to follow Jesus and his way for the rest of my life. Father, I pray for every person who raised their hand, every person who, he said, I want today want to follow Jesus. Let the old pass away and let a new creation come forth. Father, let joy be unspeakable, peace be un understanding, and Father, let them sense be filled with the love of God. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would bring people around them to encourage them, and you'd give them a hunger for your word and for your presence. God, we love you, and we thank you for the miracle that we even get to be a part of this miracle that you're doing today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, now listen before I have everyone stand. If that was you, you, you prayed that prayer and you meant it, that was your moment. There's a card in front of you. I want you to take that card out, 
I want you to fill it out. There's a box that says about, that indicates the decision you just made. Here's why. We want to celebrate it with you. You can take that card after you fill it out, take it to Connect Central. We'll give you a brand new Bible just to sow into you and say, hey, we're excited about what God's done in your life. A church is not here to hassle you. We're here to help you, and, and we want to help you begin and grow this relationship with Jesus that you've started today. I'm going to ask everyone else to stand on your feet this morning. I want to pray over you. Two things I want to pray, and I'm bringing you back into my devotional life. These are the things that I prayed that day that God really said, help me understand my bad spot is number one, when you're in a bad spot, it's often hard to give God your best. It's hard to give God your best when you're, the best is not what's going on around you. And so I want, when I pray over you, I'm going to pray that God gives you a strength. He's going to encourage you, but I want you to commit. God, I'm going to give you my best in this bad spot. I'm going to be the best spouse. I'm going to be the, the, the best employee. I'm going to be the best neighbor. Whatever it is, I'm going to be the best, not because anyone deserves it, but because I want to give it to you, God. I want you to get my best. Chances are you're not going to be in that bad spot forever. And so it's important that when you're there, you worship God with your effort and your character and your attitude. Now, here's the second thing I'm going to pray. Easter is upon us, and it is the, by far, greatest time of the year to influence someone for Jesus. It is the easiest time of year. And, and God put you where you're at in that bad spot. He, he's leaving you in that bad spot for a good purpose. You're the good in that bad spot. And I believe that you can use Easter to fulfill that mission. I want you, we put invite cards in your hands every week. You can text folks, share things, whatever you need to do. But I want you to invite for Easter. And here's what I'm going to pray. That a face, a relationship, a name appears in your heart while we're praying. And that's who God wants to reach this season through you. And, and here's what I want to tell you. You don't have to do anything. Just get them here. Save them. Tell them, say, hey, I want you to come with me. I got you a seat. Maybe if you want to buy them lunch afterwards, that's fine. But here's what I'm going to tell you. You want to have the best Easter you've ever had. Here's how to do it. Invite someone to church, and when I give uh, the altar response, when, when I give the salvation moment, and I say everyone bow their heads and close their eyes, I want you to just squint a little bit. And when you see the hand of the person that you brought go up, that's going to be better than any outfit, chocolate egg, or ham grandma could ever make. You're the good in a bad spot. And God's purpose is always people. And there's someone he wants to use you in this season to get a message to. So we're going to make it easy. You just invite them, make sure they're here, and, and we're going to see a lot of people come to Jesus. Okay, I, I want to pray for you. Father, Lord, it is not trivial, these bad spots. That's a cute name for some serious situations. Father, there are people here who have sickness people here who have financial issues, people here who, who have relationships that are broken and are in places that are very difficult. And Hebrews tells us that you are a Savior who empathizes. You understand what every person here is going through. You are not removed from this bad spot, for you took the worst of spots on the cross to show that you understand everyone that we'll ever face. And so, Lord Jesus, not only do we need saving grace, I pray sustaining grace into every person here. That they can be their best exactly where you've placed them. They can be the good in a bad spot. Father, I pray peace that passes understanding, joy that cannot be shaken from the things around us. And though a, a storm may be raging around them in that spot, let your word settle their heart in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, I pray you'd give them the strength and the boldness to say what you've done for them. Father, I pray you right now, every person would get a name, a face, a relationship that would be rising in their heart today. Someone who you desire to be in relationship with. Someone that you want to, to, to love. Someone you want to, to reach through this Easter season. I pray every invite be 100% fruitful and effective. I pray that every attempt, every effort that is shared from these people 
would have full fruit. And that, Lord, in eternity, they will share in, in the celebration that is a life changed. But, Father, you've placed them there for a person. And I pray that rise in their heart. Father, I pray it would ring in their ears, Holy Spirit, that they're the good in a bad spot. And I bless them in their coming and in their going. And, Father, I, I say that their lives will be a, a, just a, a billboard of your goodness and your favor. And that, Lord, though it is night, joy does come in the morning. And there is going to be seasons of joy. And these spots are not going to last forever. But in this moment, we'll serve you with our best. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. Let's just celebrate the word of God in our hearts. Amen. Next week's going to be incredible. You're going to want to get here early. Only two services. Get here early to get a seat. Pick up some invite cards. Easter's going to be incredible. I'm praying for you this week, and I love you. Have a great day. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that this message was an encouragement to you to live a life fully devoted to God. For more information about Twin Rivers Worship Center, or if you would like to partner with this church's ministry in St. Louis, Missouri, and around the world by giving, visit us at our website at trwc.com. We would love for you to join us in a worship service at one of our two locations sometime. Have a great day and be blessed.